Hi guys, welcome to today's MCQ discussion, MCQ discussion number 15. So let's get started. So the first question, an individual is started on the drug Domperidone for severe nausea and vomiting. Which of the following statements regarding the action of this drug is false? A. It acts on the D2 receptors of the CTZ. B. It antagonizes the D2 receptors of the pituitary. C. It reduces the prolactin secretion. Or D. It causes relaxation of the pyloric sphincter. So a little conceptual question, a lot to think. So pause, think, and then we'll discuss. So in this question, we have an individual who has nausea and vomiting and he's given a very popular, very commonly used antiemetic drug called Domperidone. The question is regarding the action of this drug. So before we answer this question, we need to know about three things. Firstly, the mechanism of action and the different pharmacological actions of Domperidone itself. A little bit about pituitary hormones, particularly prolactin regulation and then a little bit about the relationship between domperidone and prolactin. So let's talk about the pharmacological actions of the drug domperidone. So domperidone is an anti-emetic drug so it prevents nausea and vomiting and it has a two-pronged approach. It acts at the center and the periphery. So centrally it acts directly on the chemoreceptor trigger zone or the CTZ that is responsible for nausea and vomiting and peripherally it acts by reducing the gastric emptying time. So it facilitates gastric emptying and thus reducing the gastric emptying time. So how does it do this? Now we'll discuss. So firstly, centrally, it acts on the CTZ and how does it act? It acts by blocking the D2 receptor. D2 receptor is a type of dopamine receptor. So domperidone blocks the dopamine receptors in the CTZ of the CNS and thus prevents nausea and vomiting. And peripherally, it increases the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter and decreases the tone of the phyloric sphincter. So when the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter increases, food cannot move up from the stomach to the esophagus, there is no, thus there is no vomiting. And secondly, the food will move out of the stomach faster because the pyloric sphincter tone reduces. Now, these were the two functions or two ways by which domperidone caused anti-emesis. Now, a few other pharmacological actions include antagonization of D2 at the pituitary. So remember, domperidone blocks D2. It blocks D2 in the pituitary gland and we'll get to why that in, that's important in a minute. And it also blocks or has some alpha adrenergic blocking property. So we know alpha adrenergic state or adrenergic state or sympathetic state, there is reduced gastric motility and reduced intestinal motility. So when you block this alpha adrenergic activity, then the motility would improve. So that's not too important. Three things you got to remember. It acts by blocking D2 in the CTZ. It reduces the tone of the pyloric sphincter and it blocks the activity or antagonizes dopamine in the pituitary gland. So in brief, domperidone has a potent anti-dopaminergic action. So this drug is anti-dopaminergic, okay? Next, we'll talk about the second thing which we need to know to answer the question, which is the prolactin hormone regulation. So remember, prolactin is one of those rare substances that have a positive feedback loop. So most drugs have a negative feedback loop. No, most hormones rather have a negative feedback loop. But prolactin is one hormone that has a positive feedback loop. And, loop. and what does that mean? It means that prolactin itself can stimulate or induce more production of prolactin. So more prolactin, more prolactin. So it's a positive feedback loop. So prolactin is a hormone that is secreted by the lactotrophs in the anterior pituitary gland. And as we know, the anterior pituitary is always under the control of the hypothalamus. So hypothalamus, hypothalamus is the band master, right? So hypothalamus controls the anterior pituitary. Therefore, hypothalamus controls the release of prolactin hormone also. So how does hypothalamus control? So it has a negative and a positive system. So hypothalamus inhibits prolactin secretion by the pituitary by producing a substance called dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter. So when the hypothalamus produces dopamine, you will have reduced prolactin secretion. And if the hypothalamus produces something called the PRF or prolactin releasing factor, it increases. So you can see it's a positive effect. So it increases the production of prolactin from the anterior pituitary. So remember, dopamine produced by hypothalamus reduces the secretion of prolactin and prolactin releasing factor and sometimes even TRH, the th thyrotropic releasing factor, can increase the 
prolactin release from the anterior pituitary. So when under positive influence, anterior pituitary produ pro produces prolactin and when there's high dopamine, anterior produces prolactin. Now we said earlier that domperidone, right, was an anti-dopaminergic, right? It was anti-dopaminergic and it blocks the dopamine receptors of the pituitary. So now imagine, even though the hypothalamus is producing dopamine, you have something blocking the dopamine receptor in the pituitary. So when the dopamine receptors of the pituitary gland are blocked, there is no negative influence and the pituitary starts producing prolactin. So remember, domperidone blocks or antagonizes D2 receptor or dopamine receptors in the pituitary gland. And when dopamine is blocked in the pituitary, the function of dopamine reduces and when dopamine reduces, prolactin increases. Now coming to the most important part of this discussion and this topic is quizzed in many many different ways so it's very important to understand this. Remember dopamine and prolactin never come together. So I told you dopamine inhibits prolactin secretion so more the dopamine less the prolactin right and less the dopamine more the prolactin. So any condition where you have more dopamine example a person on levodopa or dopamine or on bromocryptine which is a ergot that the ergot alkaloid that has dopamine like action so any situation where you have an increase in dopamine as in a patient on levodopa or a patient on dopamine or a patient on bromocryptin you will have a reduction in prolactin so all these three drugs reduce the prolactin levels and more importantly anytime you have an anti-dopaminergic drug which means dopamine will come down you will have hyperprolactinemia or increased prolactin secretion so whenever you give an anti-dopaminergic drug you will have increased prolactin so what are the important anti-dopaminergic drugs which act mainly on the d2 receptor you have your metachlorpromide which is an anti-emetic domperidone which is an anti-emetic and chlorpromazine and flufenazine which are both antipsychotics so all these drugs block the d2 receptor or the dopamine receptor and when the dopamine receptors are blocked you'll have anti-dopaminergic activity and when there's anti-dopaminergic activity you'll have increased prolactin so all of these drugs can cause hyperprolactinemia and lead to adverse effects like uh, amenorrhea in women, infertility in women and uh, gynecomastia in men. So basically this can lead to hyperprolactinemia. So antidopaminergic can lead to hyperprolactinemia. So remember one in one line the most important thing which is which is quizzed in many ways is that D and P never go to go together. So dopamine and prolactin never go together. Dopamine goes up, prolactin goes down. If prolactin goes up, dopamine goes down. If you give an antidopaminergic, prolactin will go up. Okay, so that was D and P never coming together. Now we'll answer the question. So the first one was, what, which is false. Okay, so we're looking for what's false. So first one was acts on the D2 receptors of the CTZ. Yes, we said it does directly act on the D2 receptors of CTZ and causes central anti-emesis. So then next it antagonizes or blocks the D2 receptors of the pituitary. Yes, it does. Next, it reduces prolactin secretion. So that is false. So the answer here is C. Okay, because like we said, here you have anti-dopaminergic action and when there is anti-dopaminergic action or when the D2 receptors are blocked, you will have an increase in prolactin, causes hyperprolactinemia. So answer was C. Lastly, D causes relaxation of pyloric sphincter. Yes, it does cause relaxation, relaxation of pyloric sphincter. That was the peripheral mechanism by which this drug caused anti-emesis. So I hope that is clear now. D and P never go together. Now let's move on to the second question of the day. Very easy question. So berry aneurysm is formed due to A, endothelial injury due to hypertension, B, a congenital defect in the tunica media, C, a congenital defect in the tunica adventitia, or D, injury to the tunica media due to hypertension. So pause, think, and then we'll discuss. Yeah, so here, let's go and talk a little about berry aneurysm and then we'll answer. So what is a perianeurysm? So a perianeurysm is a thin-walled saccular outpouching of the of an artery of the brain commonly seen in the anterior circle of Willis. Okay, and remember, perianeurysm is a congenital condition. So the pathology is that congenitally there is a lack of tunica media in these vessels, and therefore these vessels are weaker and are more prone to having developing an aneurysm or having an outpouching and then eventually a rupture. So perianeurysm is a thin saccular outpouching of a vessel of the brain and it's more common in the anterior circle of Willis. And it happens due to a congenital, at birth itself this defect is there, congenital absence in the tunica media in these vessels, primarily in the anterior circle of vessel, 
anterior circular villus sorry and it is commonly associated with adpkd that is the adult polycystic kidney disease or autosomal polycystic kidney disease marfan syndrome and ehlers danlos type 4 so whenever you have any of these conditions in question always think of a berry aneurysm also prognosis after rupture it follows a rule of thirds one third of the people whose aneurysm ruptures die one third recover and one third rebleed and how do you manage it you can do either coiling or clipping coiling or clipping of this aneurysm can be done so basically all you have to remember is it's common in the anterior part of circular villus particularly in the anterior communicating artery and the anterior cerebral artery and it is a congenital absence of the tunica media that leads to this sacular outpouching to better understand i put a small illustration here so you can see how a normal artery is you have your tunica adventitia media and intima remember normally in the artery the media is the thickest and the strongest layer now in berry aneurysm there is a segment of the vessel where you have only adventitia and uh, and and intima but no media so tunica media is missing and that segment is prone to developing a sacular outpouching or an aneurysm so that was about berry aneurysm so the answer here was b it's due to congenital defect in tunica media so it is formed due to con congenital defect of tunica media but rupture is due to hypertension so remember berry aneurysm is not formed due to hypertension it is formed and it is a congenital defect okay associated with marfan's adpt kd and erler danlos type 4 most importantly defect in tunica media or absence of tunica media okay and it is congenital so the answer was b last question for today is something we've discussed earlier and which we'll just rush through quickly so on infusing parathyroid hormone in an experimental mice there is an increased resorption of bone due to osteoclastic activity which of the following statements is true a pth directly acts on pre osteoclast to cause bone resorption b the bone resorbing osteoclast does not have pth receptors c rank l plays a crucial role in the formation of mature osteoblasts or d osteoclasts produce osteoprotectin that cause bone resorption so pause think answer we've discussed this before yeah so when we discussed this question last time i told you it can be asked in many applicate application based ways and this is just one of the ways in which the same question was asked so for those who didn't attend the previous mcq discussion i'll just go through it briefly so remember osteoclasts cause bone resorption they are bone destroying cells and osteoblasts are bone forming cells or they form new bone and osteoclasts are completely under the influence of osteoblasts this is one thing i told in the last discussion those who didn't attend you can attend that for a more detailed explanation but osteoclasts are under complete control of osteoblasts and osteoblasts regulate the osteoclastic activity so parathyroid hormone is one of the hormones responsible for bone resorption but this hormone never directly acts on the osteoclast but acts via the osteoblast so here's the process once more parathyroid hormone acts on the osteoblasts and the osteoblasts have the receptor for parathyroid hormone so parathyroid hormone acts on osteoblasts and stimulates the osteoblasts to express something called a rank l ligand and a uh, mcsf which is a col uh, macrophage colony stimulating factor so under the influence of parathyroid hormone the osteoblasts produce two things rank l and macrophage colony stimulating factor and these two factors then promote the conversion or they aid or they stimulate the conversion of a osteoclastic precursor cell into a mature osteoclast and then this mature osteoclast does bone resorption or destroys the bone so remember osteoclast completely under the control of osteoblast pth although it is a osteoclastic hormone never directly acts on the osteoclasts they act on the osteoblasts and the osteoblasts then produce rank l and mcsf which lead to conversion of osteoclastic precursors into mature osteoclasts that are capable of bone resorption now that we know this and we have discussed this let's look at the question so the question was there is osteoclastic activity and which of the following statements is true regarding the osteoclastic activity seen so option a pth directly acts on the pre osteoclast to cause bone resorption so like i said pth only acts on the osteoblasts and not on the osteoclasts so therefore this is false pth acts on the osteoblast which then act on the or which then promote osteoclast so pth acting on osteoblast is false second point the bone resorbing osteoclast do not have pth receptors yes this is true and this is the answer so the answer for this question was b because i told you only the osteoblasts have pth receptors and the osteoclasts do not have osteoclasts are 
promoted by rank l and mcsf and not pth so the answer is b bone resorbing osteoclast does not have pth receptor next rank l plays a crucial role in the formation of mature osteoblasts so again false rank l produced by osteoblasts play an important role in formation of mature osteoclast so maturation of osteoclast is brought about by rank l and mcsf rank l is nothing but rank ligand so that is false and then lastly osteoclasts produce osteoprotegrin that causes bone resorption so this is again false we didn't talk about this so there is something called osteoprotegrin or opg and opg is something produced by the osteoblasts okay so again osteoblasts again are controlling the osteoclast so osteoprotegrin is a substance produced by osteoblasts and these inhibit the formation of mature osteoclasts so again osteoprotegrin produced by osteoblasts inhibit the formation of mature osteoclast so therefore they are anti osteoclast activity so anti bone resorbing so they help more in bone forming so they prevent bone resorption so in brief opg produced by the osteoblast prevent bone resorption okay so opg prevents bone resorption by preventing maturation of osteoclast another little point to be added estrogen is a is a hormone that actually increases the production of this opg and that is why estrogen has an anti osteoclastic activity or estrogen prevents bone resorption and when estrogen goes down in the perimenopause in the perimenopausal and menopausal age group estrogen levels fall rather in the menopausal age group estrogen levels fall and at that time this opg production also reduces and women are more prone to osteoporosis after menopause so that was why women are prone to osteoporosis after menopause so remember estrogen it increases opg production and opg prevents osteoclastogenesis and prevents activity of osteoclast so the option here was osteoclast wrong osteoblast produced opg which prevent bone resorption so that that's it for today we will stop i mean we are a little ahead of time but it's okay and all the best see you guys tomorrow